Well, hello and welcome to Property Question Time. Currently the only show on TV where you get to pose your questions to our guest panel of experts. I'm Keith Maynard and today on the panel I'm joined by Tim Stallard, the Head of Marketing for Auction House Essex. We have Joanna Leggett, co-founder of Leggett Immobilier, based in France. Mm -hmm. And last but by no means least, Paul Hicks, the founder and CEO of the Millbank Group. Well, thank you very much for joining us. You know the format. We have some wonderful questions from our viewers. We're going to pose them to you and you get a chance to comment and also to discuss if it takes your fancy. Uh, the first question will be coming through to you, Joanna, being our token lady, I think that's only right. <laughs> so we're coming through, um, great question this actually. I've always wanted to move abroad, but I don't know how I would deal with general issues that could crop up, things like obsessedos, mold, or even crumbling walls. It seems that I could be in for a hiding if I inadvertently bought a bad property overseas, especially with the language barrier. Is there any safety for overseas buyers? Well, I would say definitely there's safety in France. France is really highly regulated, much more regulated than it is actually in the UK. So if you're looking to buy in France, if you don't speak French, first of all, I would use an English agent because they'll help you from start to finish throughout all of the transactions. The notaire is there to protect both parties um, and they will deal with any questions and any issues. They'll check to see that there's no motorways being built nearby, etc., like they pretty much would do in the UK. There are diagnostic tests which are done before buying a property. These include asbestos, electrics, gas, all sorts of tests like that. Um, and before you sign anything, you'd be able to have those documents and check that there is nothing sort of standing out that, that, that could be worrying. Um, there are new laws in, in France as well called the Loire Allure, which protect buyers. And the buyers have a seven day cooling off period from signing a compromis de bond, which is like the exchange of contracts. And when it, within those seven days, the notaire does make regu you know, regu regular checks and has a look at um, any possibilities that, that could be a bad sign. Um, and after that, they can withdraw from the sale if they want to. So I would say it's probably one of the safest countries to buy in the world, particularly in Europe. Are there any particular things that they might have to look out for if you were considering? Is there a certain thing like maybe, you know, off the top of my head, things like, you know, doing double checks, things like Japanese knotweed if you've got an overly active garden or yeah, you know, how I, close I, trees are? I would definitely say if you're worried, because it is a big um, decision to buy a, a property overseas, particularly if you don't speak the language, there are surveyors and you can get surveyors like you would in the UK. The French don't actually have surveys done. They rely purely on the diagnostic texts, which the diagnostic cur is t a type of surveyor. But they do have English surveyors in France. And if you are worried about anything, then before putting in an offer, I'd have a survey done. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Gents, would you like to follow on from that at all? No, I think you covered it very well. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, we will move on then to our next question. Uh, Tim, this is to you. Is there still mileage in buying properties relatively cheap at property auctions? What advice would you give to somebody thinking of going to their first property auction? Okay, I wouldn't necessarily say that the property is sold cheaply. Um, what I would say is that it's sold for its market value. Um, if you looked at an example, you could look at a pair of semi-detached houses. The one on the right sells at the open market for, let's say, £300,000. But that's got a new kitchen and a new bathroom. The one on the left has the same uh, footprint, has the same footage, is essentially the same a mirror of the first. However, it's deteriorated and it needs a new kitchen, it needs a new bathroom, and it needs some love and attention. Um, so it obviously is going to sell at auction for a, a lower price than its neighbour. So I think the key word in your question there is relatively cheap, because it is cheap when compared to the property next door. However, the vendors selling at auction, they're not coming to auction to sell a property for less than it's worth. They're coming to sell at auction for the, the speed and the security of sale that uh, an auction contract would provide you. Um, and in terms of advice for somebody coming along to auction for the first time, I'd really say the most important thing for them is to ensure that their finances are in place and they're bidding from a position of security. So is there, does there tend to be, in the sense of the portfolio that you have at the property auctions, does it tend to be more um, a portfolio full of properties that are ripe for investment? Or is it really, a, is it more diverse than that? I'd say almost every property in an auction catalogue will have a potential for profit. 
But I would also say that the catalogues are very eclectic. You will have all sorts sold. The oddities in the property market are always best sold by auction. Um, ones where people wouldn't necessarily know what the value is. Uh, and then the value is obtained by getting everybody who wants to purchase it in a room and seeing who will pay the most for it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Right, let's move on. Paul. Lovely question this. Me and my wife have gone off on a whim and bought some woodland. We don't know what we can do with it. We've had various advice about building on it or potentially selling it for an unusual use, maybe as an eco grave site. What's my best course of action now I've got it? Okay, so, um, well, first thing I'd say is um, try not to buy things on a whim. Um, <laughs> it tends to not work out well. Um, it's all about planning um, here, obviously. So um, what they need to do is, is get some planning advice, basically. Um, it's going to be different in different local authorities. So uh, they need to see what the specific development plan in their area um, says about the bit of land that they've, that they've bought. Um, it's obviously woodland, so we've been told um, there may or may not be other specific designations that, that apply to it in, in planning terms. Now, depending on what they are, um, you know, it may have some potential, it may be a complete non-starter, so um, they really need proper specific planning advice in relation to that, that, that bit of land. Okay, so I guess they, they, they contact the council then and see what's in place? Or? Not, 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 re not really the council. The, um, most ca council planning departments are typically um, overworked and understaffed, so it's, um, you know, it's not easy to, to get a response out of them. So what, what they really need to do is, is take independent advice from a planning consultant. Okay. And then they would get an idea of what they could do. I mean, are there any, are there any particular things that you would recommend if they did have the, if they had no restrictions on what they could do with it? What would be a, what would be potentially a great, a great return? Well, I mean, if, if, if they had no restrictions, which is highly unlikely, um, impossible, in fact. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, t typically in, in most places in the UK, residential development ten tends to be the highest value use. Um, you know, sometimes it might be offices, but, but usually you're talking about residential development if there were no, no restrictions. But as I say, it's, it seems, you know, highly unlikely that that will, that will be the case. Um, you know, other alternative uses that may or may not be acceptable in the, you know, countryside type areas, I'm assuming it's countryside because they talk about woodland, are, are generally, you know, agricultural and equestrian type uses. Maybe something slightly off the wall like the, you know, Great yards yeah, and, and stuff yeah. like that, but um, re really it depends on detailed planning policy. Lovely. Okay, thank you very much. Interesting question, that well answered. Right, uh, golden nugget time. So this is our opportunity to find out what really makes you tick, what you're passionate about. Um, Joanna, I'm going to come to you first, and I believe you want to talk to us about where in France we should live or we might like to live. Well, I think where to live in France is the big question. Um, every area of France is very different. And I think because it is a purchase overseas, it's really, really important that you go and you do a recce trip. You go and spend some time in that area. You go and see what's open in the winter because a lot of people make the mistake that they go in the summer, everything's fantastic, everything's open. They go back in the winter and it's like a ghost town because the restaurants, bars, etc., etc., are only open between April and September. So my great tip would be to go and go and visit a property in the winter. And then it depends what you want to use that property for. If you're using it for rental, then it doesn't really matter. There's certain areas that are good for yield or investment. If you're using it for holidays and you want to rent it for the holiday market, then you may also want to make sure it's, a, it's an area where other people would want to go and rent as well. Um, but I would say that the location when you're buying abroad is really important. Okay. Are there any particular, particular parts of France that people should look at? I would say the British market generally tend to go for the southwest of France, the south of France and the Alps, um, coming all the way down the south coast. Not so much Alsace and the east of France. We don't see many British buyers there. And so obviously that's going to affect resale. So I would always try to stick to the areas which are popular. And France is huge. It's the, one of the biggest countries in Western Europe. So there's plenty of, um, you know, you'll have plenty of space and you'll have beautiful countryside to drive around in but I would definitely say this you know coming down from Brittany Normandy at the top all the way down the southwest coast and down into the Languedoc Roussillon areas are very good 
And is that still a secure investment with Macron now, of course, coming to power in France? Is that changing anything? Even it's more secure, we believe, <laughs> to the other option we could have had. So, um, yeah, we, uh, I definitely say that, that everybody's quite confident and everyone's quite behind Macron. Well, it's time now to take a short break, but make sure you do tune in again in a few minutes' time when we'll be looking at certain misconceptions within the property market and why it's important to always make a strong opening bid if you're visiting a property auction. See you in a few moments. Well, thanks for rejoining us. You are watching Property Question Time here on Property TV and our guest panel of experts have been sharing with us their various experiences to do with the property market. And in fact, on that point, I'm gonna to come to you next, Paul, and ask you about the misconceptions of what off-market means. Could you expand? I could, and this is um, one of my little uh, favorites, actually. <clears throat> so um, I I'm sp speaking mainly in the, the context of um, land and development, because that's, that's, that's what I do, but the, it, this pretty much applies to, to all the property, yeah? So I think, um, it might be best if I first deal with the, uh, what, what off-market isn't, okay? So I know that lots of people think off-market means that a property is, um, you know, it's not on right move, it's not with an agent, it's not officially on the market. They think as long as it's not that, that means it's off-market, okay? Uh, now that's not actually the case because um, lots of property may be, although not strictly on the market with an, with an agent, it's, it's in the market by virtue of the fact that um, the owner's thinking about selling, he's talking to people about it, other people may be looking at the property and perhaps making offers and bidding on it. So, uh, so that is not off-market, okay? What uh, off-market really is, and, and this is the, the only type of deal that could really, really be off-market, is where um, I, as a, a developer, or um, someone else as perhaps a, a deal finder or a late land agent, spots a uh, building or a bit of land with potential, approaches the owners directly themselves in a very specific way um, and then creates an opportunity and then they, they're talking and uh, so they're effectively talking one-on-one -on -one to each other and there, there isn't anyone else involved. That and only that is a proper off-market deal. Um, so it's a, a, the short answer is it's, it's where you've spotted something yourself or someone else has spotted something themselves, approach the owner directly um, and then they're talking to you and only you. That's off-market, anything else isn't properly off-market. So what kind of things are, are often referred to as off-market and what's the danger in that? I think what happens is that um, if a... Uh, and again, so I can only speak in the context of land and development sites, okay? Now, what, what actually happens is, is when people think something's off-market, um, they get super excited and uh, the price tends to get bid up. Okay, so so for example, I I know for a fact there are there are sites and deals out there that um, you know they're being talked of or presented as being off market. You know, but there might be fifty people looking at looking at it. Yeah, all of those fifty people will think that they've got some specific in on the deal, um, which they which they won't have because it's effectively you've got 50, 50 people bidding against each other. Yeah, it all gets silly. The the type of people, the type of buyers again in the development world that believe that that's how it works. Um, are, are, are the ones that, that bid the price up and, and very often end up not performing and the whole thing gets silly and you waste a load of time, yeah? Any sensible developer knows, you know, they, they can tell a, a mile off whether a deal's properly off-market or not. Okay, so, 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 so non-off-market non deals, ones that, where people think they are off-market, mm. they're even worse than ones that are on-market, to okay. be honest. So it's almost being used as a crude tool to push up the price in some Yeah, exactly, and, it, and it, it, it attracts the, the wrong people, the sort of people that don't actually end up performing, but they, they waste a lot of time. Excellent. Thank you very much for clearing that up. Right, okay, uh, Joanna, I'm coming back to a question to you now from uh, one of our, our lovely viewers at home. Um, this one is, again, to do with being abroad, I'm new to investing in property. Where in France or Belgium might I get a property providing a high yield? Um, well, firstly, I can't comment on Belgium because we just cover France. Um, and it really depends. There's different ways of looking at France. If you're buying a holiday home, then rural countryside positions, if you want to use the home yourself, would, would get you great yields in the summer months. However, in the winter months, it's going to be empty. If you're looking at just purely investment, then the provincial type towns like Angoulême, 
Poitiers, um, Nantes, et towns where there's big student populations will have the highest yields, but they won't necessarily have the highest capital growth. If you're looking at capital growth, you'd probably be looking at towns that, or cities like Paris, um, perhaps in the Alps, etc., the Côte d'Azur, where you will get capital appreciation, um, but perhaps not as high yields as you would in the big provincial cities. Um, but you'd be looking at yields of between 6 and 10%. Okay, and, and, and how many years typically would you need to kind of remain in your investment in France? If you were, can you make a, a short term gain and get in and get out? You can do, but you are going to be subject to capital gains tax, of course. So it, the longer you have the property in France, the less capital gains tax you pay. So it used to be 15 years. Unfortunately, now it's 30. So you would have to have it quite a long time. But every five years, it, it does reduce. Um, so the longer term, you, the longer time you have the property, you've got more chance of the capital growth and obviously higher yields. Right, okay, so in a sense it's better for a long-term investment, if anything. Yes, yes, right. unless you're buying the property and you want to use it yourselves. Um, for example, in the Alps, they have all-year-round rental because the summer rental sometimes is higher than the winter, and more tourists visit in the winter, uh, summer months than they do in the winter. Um, so again, it, you could use it for, say, two months of the year yourselves and rent it out for the rest of the other eight. And with it being holiday rental, it's quite high. Would the Alps be initially a higher investment, though, due to the popularity and the fact you've got a higher yes. return all year round? Yes, the property prices are quite high there, mm. um, but they're not that dissimilar to the Côte d'Azur or to Paris. Um, Paris is obviously the highest, being similar to London, mm. um, but the Alps is you know, much higher than you would in... Uh, prices would be much higher than they would be in the southwest of France. I know I prefer between the Alps and Paris <laughs> every single time. Fantastic. OK, thank you very much. Right, let's uh, move on. Tim, I've got a question for you here. I'm really interested in a property that's going to auction next month. Can I buy it before the property actually goes to auction? Okay. I most definitely would never discourage anyone from making an offer. That decision will usually fall with the vendors. Um, so it would be a case of contacting the auctioneers, extend your offer over, um, and, and they'll extend that again over to the vendor and see if they'll accept it. There are two quite important points to remember, though, if you're making a, a pre-auction offer. Um, one is that it's still going to be sold on auction terms, which would usually be 10% deposit, exchange the contracts on the day, and you'll have 28 days in which to complete. Uh, with most properties, that will be the case. Um, the other point to remember is if that offer is rejected, that doesn't mean you can't buy it for that price in the auction hall. Um, vendors will often have an, in, an inflated expectation of what price is going to be achieved in the auction hall and reasonable offers will get turned down in the weeks preceding the auction. However, if the interest isn't there to, to fulfil the vendor's expectation, then you might even get it cheaper in the room. That being said, I, as I said a moment ago, I would never discourage anyone from making an offer prior to auction even just for the valuable feedback that you can obtain from doing so. So it's worth a punt, but, Absolutely. but, but you know, in a lot of circumstances probably you won't get, unless it's a particularly high and you're prepared to pay above maybe the, what the property's yeah. worth, you may not get any joy from it. I would say that it depends on the circumstances surrounding the individual property more mm. than anything else. Um, so yes, absolutely, as you said, worth a punt. Um, but whether you'll be successful or not is a, a different story. And it's interesting to pick up on what you were saying there about how quickly it has to be completed and the fact mm -hmm. that you know you get to exchange straight away. Yeah. I'm guessing, therefore, if someone wants to get on the housing ladder very, very quickly and they're able mm -hmm. to do that financially, it's a very good way of, uh, of getting hold of a property without the kind of long, drawn-out legal processes that can sometimes happen. Yes, it's a, a, a very quick and clean method of sale. Um, 28 days, as I said, is the standard completion time. Uh, those completions can be amended via something called the special conditions. Um, so it won't be all lots that are sold by auction have a 28-day completion. I would say the vast majority of lots being sold across the country by auction, they will expect you to complete within 28 days. You exchange contracts at the auction hall, and in fact the banging of the gavel signifies the binding legal contract. Um, so you get taken over to a cashier's desk whereby you'll go through a memorandum of sale. Uh, but at that point, you've exchanged contracts. You'll also pay your 10% deposit. Um, and then you've got your completion period, whatever it is, normally 28 days. And after that, it's done. It's done and dusted. Whew. That sounds nice. Mm -hmm. Not nicer than some of the experiences I've been through. <laughs> OK, great. Thank you, Tim. Um, Paul, I've got a, a question here for you. 
how would you recommend approaching a situation where land is up for sale without planning permission, but you think there's a good probability that you would get planning? Okay, so I, it's, I guess the question is, it, is it a, a you, me, you, or... or it's neither, it's or, someone or, watching. Or, or generally, okay, because obviously how I would do it, you know, will be perhaps quite different to the general public, let's, let, let's okay. say, or someone that was less experienced, okay? How would you recommend then? How oh, okay, so the, the literally the, the million, usually multi-million dollar question when bought with development land is what's it worth, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's the planning permission is the thing that adds the value, so development is really clearly all about learning how to add maximum value to land through, through planning. So when it hasn't got planning, the question is, of course, what can I get planning for? What will I get planning for? What do I need to do in order to maximise the value of the land? Okay, so and that's that's going to tell you what it's what the land is worth to you with planning. Okay, but of course, there's a big, big question over you know what are you going to get planning for? Okay, I'm like to think I'm fairly good at that now, so you know I, I can I you know I know what land's land's worth. If you're if you're less experienced, you know that's it's a, it's a difficult question to answer. It's basically the hardest thing in development is working out. You know, what can I get on the site? What will I get planning permission for? And therefore, you know, what's it cost to build? What can I sell it for? What does it what does it make the, the land worth? Okay, so if someone less experienced was was buying land, they they really need to try to buy it conditionally. Okay, so um, if, you know there are, there are two broad ways of buying land. So it's effectively unconditionally, which is same way you buy a house, you know, you, you agree the deal, you sort out your legals, you exchange contracts, typically 28 day, days later you will complete and then you, you will own it, yeah? That's effectively an unconditional purchase, of course, you, and you can do that with land, um, but of course you've you got a big risk over, you know, what's the purchase price? What do you offer for it? What may it be worth in the future if and when it's got planning, okay? So, you know, I sometimes buy, buy land unconditionally, um, but even me, most of, most of the time, in order to minimise risk, um, I'll be trying to buy it conditionally, okay? And that's what I would advise anyone else to try to do. So what you would effectively do is say, um, you know, uh, I think your, your property is worth a million quid as it is. Let's say, you know, with planning permission, I think it could be worth two million quid. How about, you know, you agree to sell it to me for two million quid, subject to me getting planning permission, yeah? So it's a conditional deal. That, 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 that way you, you're effectively de-risking the situation. So, you know, it, you know, and if you don't get planning permission, of course, you don't buy it for two million quid. Mm, that sounds like very good advice to me, definitely. So only buy it on the condition that you get that, that planning permission. Unless you really know what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. No, I don't, I'm guessing, reading by the, the question, I don't think they do. So that's probably good advice. So. Most people don't. So thank you very much, Paul. Okay, I think we've got time for one more golden nugget. Tim, I'm going to come to you. Um, tell us, what are the benefits of a strong opening bid at an auction? Okay, there's uh, a bit of a misconception amongst auction buyers uh, and some very seasoned auction buyers as well, uh, whereby they think the, the best way to get a, a cheap hammer price for a property is to sit on their hands until the end, uh, wait till everybody else has done their bidding and then swoop in and, and steal it with a last minute bid. Um, I very much think that this isn't the case and if anything what you're doing there is you're allowing everybody else to drive up the price of the property that you want to buy. I think that a far better method is a strong, confident, opening, spoken bid. So for example, if you're willing to pay let's say £250,000 for a property, the auctioneer opens it to the room asking for a bid of £230,000 why not stand up and be confident and bold and say 240,000? And what you're going to do there is show all of your competition that's in the room that you're here to do a deal. Um, you, you're going to do what it takes to get that property and a couple of the bidders will look at that confidence uh, and turn the other way. And I've seen on a number of occasions um, some quite bold people get themselves a, a cheap, good, good value property from one bid just by standing in the room and it's, it's just telling the whole room that you're here to do the deal and everybody else has got to look at the next lot. Would there be a, a typical percentage that you would recommend to go up on, on what the opening is in order to make that work? Is there a, a magic formula? There's no magic formula, no. It's, uh, it's a bit of a game really in the room. You have to read the people around you um, and see when they're running out of steam, etc. 
every property is different. Um, so unfortunately, I don't think I could give anyone a magic formula. Um, but I do think that that could be a valuable tool to earn somebody a bargain. Is it something you've ever considered? Having, uh, buying, a, buying a property at auction or you've been through the process? I, I actually, 30 plus years ago, I, I started off by buying an auction um, and it was uh, a very, very different world uh, mm. then. I like to call it, um, it pre-homes under the hammer days. Mm. The um, <clears throat> things were, um, and, and then very, very different to it is now. I, I rarely buy auction anymore, um, usually because the things, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing bigger stuff. Um, well, I'm focusing on off-market deals and, um, and it's, it's land and it tends to be bigger things that don't really um, end up at auction that much. So, mm. so I, I, now and then I sell at auction, don't buy there anymore. Okay. So you still use the process, which is great. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed to all of you. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for on today's Property Question Time. But thank you for taking the time to answer those questions. And thank you to you for watching. Don't forget, if you want to pose your question to our panel and get it answered here on television, then it's very simple. You can join us on the website, which is property-tv.co.uk. Follow the instructions, ask your question, and pretty soon you may well hear it answered live for you on TV. Thanks very much for watching. Have a good week. We'll see you soon.